Tell us your name, what you're running for, and what experience do you have that makes you feel prepared to fill this position? Sure, so my name is David Hurley, running for Buncombe County Sheriff. And I feel like one of the bigger advantages that I have coming into this is I'm not coming, I'm not looking at it as a uh, career law enforcement uh, professional. I've only got three and a half years of law enforcement. I was in the Marine Corps before that, but I also have uh, over a decade of business experience. Okay, what are your feelings on the $1.75 million county grant to reduce jail populations, which to some seems to be the root cause of recidivism in the county? Some claim the magistrates won't keep people in jail because of that process. How would you do things differently when it comes to that program? We gotta start at the enforcement level. Uh, once people are already in jail, you know, obviously the jail is only so big. And I think the, the more people that we put in jail for particular crimes, it, it, doesn't, isn't, it doesn't do any good. There's no use in just throwing everybody in jail. Somebody who shoplifts something, who's 17, 18 years old, we go and throw them in jail, that's gonna do nothing but really cause problems for them later on in life. However, what we need to reserve the jail for and what jails were intended for in the beginning was to house people that are going to be um, they're, they're gonna pose some sort of risk to society if they are in a jail, uh, or even to themselves. You know, sometimes we arrest people not because they're a risk to somebody else, but because they're a risk to themselves and they need to have you know, the support and the help they need. Um, I think you know, we've been, one of, the, one of the, the highest populators of the jail system right now is the war on drugs, and the war on drugs does absolutely nothing. We've seen it since the war on drugs was, was uh, first declared, and we keep doing the same thing, arresting drug dealers, putting them in jail. They get out on bail, and then they go back and they're selling drugs on the street again. So again, it's at the enforcement level. We need to change the way we do the enforcement, which ultimately puts people in jail for a longer period of time, those that need to be in jail. Um, having less people in jail, I think, would also speed up the judicial process so that people are actually going in front of the magistrate or going in front of the judge sooner which, you know, as Americans, we're supposed to have a right to a speedy trial. Uh, we don't see that right now. People sit in jail forever. And then they finally have a trial date, and the worst outcome is they have a trial date and they're found not guilty. So they sat in jail for six months, only to find out that they're not guilty, and there's no, no recourse, no action that they can take uh, for sitting in jail and not being afforded that, that uh, opportunity to a speedy trial. So I think with, uh, in terms of what, the, what this money is being spent towards, it's a no-brainer. We don't need a bunch of money to figure out how to enforce the right crimes and, and put people in the programs that are going to benefit them most. So I think um, I'm, I'm all for lowering the jail population, but we need to be putting people behind bars that need to be there and then figuring out some other ways to get people in front of the court, uh, in front of the, uh, the, mag the magistrates and the judges sooner so that they can be uh, processed through. Is the issue surrounding low bail and the regular occurrence of criminals getting out with a slap on the wrist and general lack of criminalization when is it's clear, clearly warranted, in fact, the fault of the magistrate, judges, and DA, or is it truthfully because the jail is short-staffed? I think it's the whole judicial system from the bottom up, um, from the enforcement level all the way up to the judges. What do you think is the most effective way to deal with low-level drug offenders? Um, it depends on are they are they users you know somebody that possesses the drugs uh, or is it somebody that's actually selling drugs um, right now we're seeing a, you know a huge rise I think in Boca County right now is number four in the state for opiate overdoses um, that's nothing to be proud of and so with that we got to figure out who the people are that are selling drugs and a lot of times we know because they've been arrested multiple times but we are not the risk versus reward. Um, of selling drugs isn't high enough, right? One of the, one of the uh, laws that Governor Cooper passed is um, death by distribution, right? Which essentially, if you were charged with death, death by distribution, meaning I sell him drugs and, and he overdoses and dies, then now I'm charged with his murder, right? Now we're putting people in jail for a long time. They're going to prison for a long time. Uh, right now, it's, it's an open door, and I think because of the culmination of uh, the jail population, because the jails are short-staffed, um, because of other you know, political influences, and then uh, because we've just got, you know, we've got um, this, this sort of lackadaisical attitude towards drugs in general now, um, 
people are just getting cycled through and, and it's at the taxpayer's expense. We're the ones that have to pay for everybody going into the jail system, being processed, being prosecuted, uh, and then being let go. What do you see as the most pressing issues in Asheville, Buncombe County? Uh, what are the root causes and how will you make changes to better the safety and crime in our communities, especially considering everyone is so understaffed? Okay, so uh, I actually just sent out a 10 question survey to Buncombe County residents so I could actually figure out what these answers are. And the top three things, um, the biggest one contributing to crime right now is homelessness. Um, you know, the city and the county, they're not doing a good enough job right now at getting people the resources they need and getting them off the street, right? Housing them under a roof with, with a no questions asked policy, all that does is pile uh, people who truly need shelter and are, are you know, just down on their luck for a little while. Um, it's putting a, them in a situation where, A, there's a safety concern for them. Um, we're putting people who need a lot more rehabilitation into these communities where you've got residents living all around. Uh, for example, the Ramada Inn, you've got residents living in the area and they shouldn't be subject to petty crime, uh, mainly property crimes, which we're seeing in the survey, that's the number two concern right now is property crimes. Um, you know, with homelessness comes some other criminal issues. Uh, the panhandling on the street, it's not an issue. You know, as much as everybody doesn't like seeing panhandlers, you have the constitutional right to stand out of the corner. Now, if you go bust somebody's window in, now we've got a crime. But if you just go out there and you're asking for money, it's not a crime. Um, however, if you go into the Home Depot and you're stealing so that you can get your next fix, there's a crime. So we need to, we need to stop you know, acting like um, we, we all need to be uh, you know, touchy-feely with the homeless population as a whole at the expense of our tax money and residents who live in these areas um, you know, where we're placing homeless populations. And instead, the city and county need to do a better job of taking everybody's concerns into account and then come up with some good decisions based on that. Under North Carolina law that governs nuisance areas, are you willing to enforce those laws? Um, it, it, it really depends, I think, on the, the exact circumstance. Um, we, we've gotten, you know, as a society into the position where we just create laws when certain groups of people aren't happy with things. You know, now all of a sudden it becomes illegal to do it. Uh, laws were supposed to be created and intended to keep others safe and prevent people from doing, you know, essentially uh, uh, stripping somebody else's constitutional rights away from them. The right to walk down the street without being mugged. Um, these, you know, the more laws that we, that legislation creates and puts on top of the society, it just depresses the society further. So it has to be something that's looked at to an individual basis. Right, I think people in that question refer to places like the Ramada and mm -hmm. A-Hope mm -hmm. where we know that we're having a bunch of issues surrounding, I mean, we've had prostitution over here with Ramada, we've had drug dealers, we've had a huge drug bust, we've mm -hmm. had deaths, overdoses. I mean, it's clearly become a, a, you know, a nuisance to the community, sure. <clears throat> but it hasn't been, you know, looked into for the nuisance abatement, mostly because it's transferring over to a different company. Oh. But places like A-Hope, who are open and causing problems for the neighboring businesses, the church over there, and you know the neighbors, um, it, if it were in that sort of spectrum, would that be something that you would be willing to support a nuisance abatement? Yes, and I, I think we've got to look at it from, you know, under a different microscope. Um, if if this were to apply to let's say a community, you know, and it's not has nothing to do with housing homeless population, um, it's just a community, and, and inside that community, there's one house that is constantly having parties where there's there's constantly uh, uh, you know, people showing up at all hours of the night where there's been um, gunshots. If somebody went to the police with that, that would become a, a project that the police would then work on. So just because we're trying to solve a homeless issue and put a roof over people's heads doesn't mean that we get to just disregard crimes from happening. Um, you know, we're, we're still, as law enforcement, our job is to keep people safe. We can't effectively keep people safe if there, there becomes a shield around certain areas where they just go and nah, disregard this crime. Because, because we understand what they're going through and therefore you can't enforce the crimes over here on this property. 
Can you answer calls inside the city limits? Considering APD has such a shortage, are you willing to have your deputies help city PD answer calls for service if county isn't backed up at the time? So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the sheriff. The sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer of the county. Uh, the sheriff is also the chief executive and administrative officer of the county. Uh, this isn't determined by me. This has been determined by people long ago. With that being said, as the chief law enforcement officer, um, it is the sheriff's obligation being the highest uh, elected law enforcement uh, official in the county to make sure that all citizens, whether they're in city, uh, city limits or not, um, have the right to safety, have the right to go outside of their home and feel safe, um, have the right to live in a community where they feel safe, and have the right to uh, you know, average and, and expedient response times for certain crimes. If that's not happening, um, the sheriff actually has the, the authority to take over that uh, law enforcement entity. So if APD doesn't have the, the capability to provide the bare necessities for safety to the people of Asheville, then the sheriff should be stepping in right now and just saying, you know what, to keep people safe, we're going to go ahead and uh, annex in Asheville. Uh, existing APD members or existing APD uh, uh, police officers and even leadership which be folded into the ranks of the sheriff's office and then it would all fall, fall underneath the uh, the sheriff's purview um, even right now I think there are uh, sheriff's deputies responding for calls to service within the city of Asheville but you know that's that's a band-aid and it's something that county taxpayers are right now paying for when the city is supposed to be paying for their own policing and they can't do it so therefore something needs to happen at a at a, a leadership level at a political level to go ahead and and make sure that people get what they deserve without having to pay extra taxes being short staffed at apd and sheriff's department uh and losing staff to other places like henderson county what are you going to do as sheriff to get more deputies on the road and inside the jail <clears throat> what is your goal and guidelines when recruiting deputies to work at the sheriff's office? So interestingly enough, uh, I happened on a guy that worked in the uh, jail for two years and it was nice because I got to ask him some questions. Um, he said, no, you know, nobody really wants to work in the jail. Um, if, if you have a job that nobody wants to work for and it's outside the jail, let's say, uh, you know, you're going to be the garbage man. Uh, the garbage people that you go and talk to right now that collect the, uh, the garbage every day, they get paid well. They've got good benefits, right? Because people understand that this isn't a job that people are aspiring to do. So when it comes to working in the jail, um, it's not, you know, nobody's lining up at the door to have this position. So I think that it's imperative that we look at that aspect of the sheriff's office, um, offer some better benefits, right? But we need to also be putting people, um, you know, really analyzing the people who are applying to work there because obviously if it's a higher paying job, people just go, well, that's the job I want, I'll make more money. But we need to make sure that we're, we're hiring people uh, in those positions that can, can deal with the jail population humanely and effectively and not end up being something where, you know, it's a national headline like I just saw recently where, you know, uh, they opened up the, the door and shot the guy with the rubber bullets inside of his jail cell. Um, it, it, that just turns Buncombe County into, you know, a laughing stock of, of America. And we can't do that. Um, I think right now, well, I'll fast forward to what I would do. For the hiring process, there needs to be, number one, an external, um, uh, called a lie detector. Uh, there needs to be somebody doing that externally. Right now, they've been folded into the sheriff's office. They're on the sheriff's office salary. The problem with that is, you know, the law enforcement has always been a good old boy club. Right? So if somebody comes and applies and they have to pass this test and they're just, you know, it's a good friend of somebody's, they can pass and nobody knows the difference. Um, I think that we've also, within hiring, we've got to have standards within law enforcement. We're required to have our military personnel pass physical fitness tests twice a year. Uh, they've got to be able to um, shoot a gun and pass twice a year. And then there's no reason why in, in the, the uh, career of law enforcement, while we don't have some sort of communications qualifications, you need to be able to go out and communicate with individuals uh, effectively. Otherwise, you just have people running around with a badge and a gun 
that end up being headlined uh, you know, for, for shooting people in the back. And it becomes a racial issue, and now we've got more than we need. That, that particular deputy or that officer should have been identified early on through the different qualifications, whether it be uh, fitness level, um, or whether it be that communications qualification. If they don't pass that, if they don't have the ability to communicate with an individual, then they probably shouldn't be a police officer or law enforcement. And we're gonna do this last question and then a final thought. Okay. <clears throat> How often are you willing to sit down with leaders of your communities, groups, uh, or neighborhood associations to see what they need and how you, you can help them? Every day, every day. Let's and do one more since you gave a quick answer. Okay. Will you institute a fair and open promotional program? What do you mean? For employees in the Sheriff's Department. Yeah, I, I, I think um, you know, people go into careers with the, you know, the hopes that they can advance to the ranks. So I think that's important. Okay, uh, let's do one more. Will you keep reserve deputy program and even increase the number of reserve deputies? Yes, among other programs that I think could be uh, uh, deployed right here in the city of Asheville to prevent some of the, the crime that happens inside of Asheville. Okay, let's finish on a final thought. Anything you want your constituents to know, people who are voting? Sure. Um, it's a number one. It's important for people to go out and vote. Uh, you know, I'm I'm doing these. I'm sitting down and, and being interviewed and, and trying to communicate with both sides. I'm I'm running as a Democrat, um, but I have no problem sitting down and talking with conservatives and answering their questions. At the end of the day, I want people to vote for me because I'm honest and transparent. If I say something you don't like, don't vote for me. But where I'm coming from is the voice of reason. I'm right in the middle of the road. Uh, I, I I feel like this whole Democrat Republican infighting is, is preventing us from America to actually being able to get along. And if we focus on the real issues that we have here in Buckham County, we have a sheriff that can focus on those issues, the issues of homelessness, um, the issues of petty crime, the issues where you know people are being housed in areas where you know residents um, don't want them. Um, there's plenty of land in Buncombe County. We could be doing something more with that land that the county has. I think uh, it's important that people also look past years of experience. We've seen people in office with years of experience that are horrible. And then we see people with no years of experience that get into positions of leadership that do great. It's because they're problem solvers. So what we need in these positions is problem solvers. Frankly, I don't think we need somebody in, in the sheriff's office that has 30 years of law enforcement because they're gonna run it like a chief of police. Nothing's gonna be uh, changed. And the constitutional aspect, the whole reason why a sheriff exists in the first place, is just going to be overlooked just like it has been in the past. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for giving us the time, and we appreciate you. You're welcome.